Wedge Issues is brought to you by Wispolitics.com, a place where political insiders go for news, opinion, and campaign information. Once again, that's Wispolitics.com. Leah Vukmir likes to describe herself as a mom with a cause. And now as she challenges U.S. Senator Tammy Baldwin, the Republican state senator is looking to take her cause to Washington. I'm Jesse O'Poyan, and this is Wedge Issues, a Cap Times podcast about the 2018 elections in Wisconsin. Leah Vukmir was first elected to the state legislature in 2002 after getting her start in politics as an activist concerned with her daughter's school reading program. After 16 years in the state assembly and senate, she's challenging Tammy Baldwin in hopes of going to the senate to make changes in health care, tax, and immigration policy. Leah Vukmir joined me this week to talk about her campaign, her biggest concerns with Tammy Baldwin's record, her career as a nurse, and of course, her favorite Wisconsin beer and cheese. And she also made me super jealous when I asked her the coolest concert she's ever attended. Stay tuned in just a minute to hear our conversation. Well, thank you so much for being here. I'm going to start you off with a really easy question and just ask you why you're running for the U.S. Senate. Well, thanks for inviting me. I really appreciate it, Jesse. This is a great opportunity to get my message out. I'm running because uh, I am a mom with a cause who never thought I was going to get into politics and have been able to make a difference here in the Wisconsin legislature. We've turned our state around. I call it an economic miracle. And I want to take that common sense to Washington, where I think they could use a good dose of our Wisconsin common sense. I feel that Senator Baldwin hasn't represented our Wisconsin values, and I think I'm the best person to take her on, and I think we're going to win on November 6th. It's it's always kind of an interesting push and pull because uh, people who are working in politics in Wisconsin like to talk about the fact that things get done in Wisconsin. Government actually sort of functions here, and you're looking to go into the sort of uh, wild east of of Washington, uh, where things are kind of chaotic and and dysfunctional at times. Um, Why did the time feel right now to step out from a place where you probably feel pretty confident that you can actually accomplish some of the things that you want to do and go somewhere where it's a little bit more challenging? Well, that's a great question, and I've thought about it a lot, and I've been asked that a lot. You know, why would you want to go to the dysfunction of Washington, D.C. when you've been able to accomplish so much? But it all goes back to how I got into this in the first place. This was never an ambition of mine. And I saw an opportunity to make a difference. In the case of uh, my family, it was because I was concerned about how reading was being taught in my daughter's kindergarten classroom. And it started me on this odyssey of going to school board meetings and writing letters to the editor and participating in this civic process that... Well, truthfully, our founding fathers envisioned we learn about it in school. I actually did it. And it was pretty exciting to see how we made a difference. And I think that that's the same sort of approach that needs to be taken in Washington. And, and that's a perspective I have from somebody who got into the state assembly when there were just a small number of us conservatives. And we gradually and patiently grew our numbers until we were able to accomplish what we did here in Wisconsin. And so when I think about it, and I got into it when my kids were very young, and now I look at them now, they're adults. I got into it because of my kids. Now I'm concerned about their kids and their grandchildren. And I'm not ready to throw in the towel on this great country. I think that if we were able to slowly and patiently turn things around in Wisconsin, we can do the same in Washington if we have people who are willing to roll up their sleeves and do the tough work. And some of that tough work means you know, having to deal with the polarized nature of Washington. And certainly I've experienced with that from here in Wisconsin. And I think people are really looking for individuals who also are willing to work across the aisle and get things done. And as polarizing as it always appears, and partly through the lens of media, We've actually done some great things together, and there are those of us who have working relationships that have allowed us to do things together. And I think that's what people are looking for. They want people to solve problems and get things done. And that's the approach I've taken here in Wisconsin, and I want to do the same in Washington. 
Yeah. What are some of the things that you're proud of having accomplished in the legislature and maybe in particular some of those things where you've worked across the aisle and gotten consensus on some things? Certainly. Well, education was the issue that got me interested in the first place. And at the time that I was a mom with a cause, my uh, children were in the Wauwatosa School District, my daughter was, and neighboring city of Milwaukee was beginning the first and the landmark program for school choice, the Milwaukee Parental Choice Program. So I was there at the ground level. I was there with the parents that began that program, the leaders of the community, and it was a great experience to see a bipartisan coalition of business leaders, elected officials, and um, community members coming together with that program. And it really sparked my interest in, in, in the political process. So for me to then take that to 10 years later, getting into the legislature and to be on the education committee and be the person that was given the charge of the first big charge, lifting the cap on the Milwaukee Parental Choice Movement program, and to have marshaled since then many pieces of legislation through the process as we've taken that small little program and now turned it into a statewide program, and also to expand it just last session with a special needs voucher program, which was always a project of mine that I I felt that I wanted to do while I was in the legislature. Mm -hmm. I'm glad I was able to do that. Polly Williams was one of those inspirational people at the beginning, and to have seen her in action as a lawmaker at the beginning of the school choice movement and then to actually get to serve with her was really an honor, and she was always very gracious and um, mentored me in a way that a lot of people wouldn't think would happen given that we were on the other si- on, yeah. on the opposite sides of the aisle. So you were first elected to the assembly in 2002, Scott Walker's old seat, yes. big shoes to fill. Um, and then you went on to the, the Senate in 2010. You defeated a Democrat when you won for that office, right? I seem to have this You're looking uh, to do that <laughs> deja vu or Groundhog Day, whatever you want, taking on a first term incumbent Democrat and giving up a seat to do it. But that's okay. I'm familiar with this position and I'm doing it again. Yeah. Um, well, what are, what are some of the lessons that stand out to you from that first length of time in the Assembly and then um, the, the last few years that you've been in the Senate? Well, I think it's really important that you stand up for your principles, but you also need to uh, be able to get things done. And so when I look, let's go back to the choice movement. If I had dug my heels in from the beginning and said, okay, I'm in the legislature now and I want to have a statewide program, I would have not gotten anything done. Yeah. And so I think it's important, and, and truthfully, we have had a bipartisan approach to school choice in those early years, and it's kind of sad to see that it's fallen away and that it's turned into such a partisan issue. But, you know, to gradually grow that program and to realize that you can still stand up for your principles, but then also you can, um, you know, still get things done, but you have to be patient. I think the other lesson, and it was a lesson that I learned from a very dear friend of mine, I know you know him, Senator Ted Canavis, and I have remarked about this, and he advised me when I first got elected in 2002, he said, Leah, develop friendships with people on the other side of the aisle. It will make your time here in the legislature far more enjoyable and productive. I took him to heart, and truthfully, it kind of a lot of people scratch their heads when they see Senator Lena Taylor and I joking around on joint <laughs> finance, or mm-hmm. we've driven to the Capitol before because we, when I was living in Wauwatosa, we're not far from one another and have uh, developed a friendship with many other people. A lot of people, in fact, if you talk to the PAGE staff, the committee that they want to serve and work on the most is the Senate Health Committee because <laughs> they enjoy the banter between uh, Senators Carpenter and Erpenbach and myself. And, yeah. and we really try to focus in, I think, and we've done a good job because of our friendships to just focus in on the merits of an issue. We may not agree ultimately, but I believe it's really important when you're the chair of the committee to uh, make sure that all members know what's happening, not to pull any surprises. And and I know that from having been in the minority as well. And I think that there's a uh, an understanding when you've been in that position that you really need to have respect for the other party. I learned that when I was in the minority in the assembly. 
And Sheldon Wasserman, for example, was the chair of the health committee, and I was the ranking member. <laughs> and we worked really well together. Yeah. And I and I and you don't forget those lessons. And, and I think the lesson from Ted Cannabis really stayed with me and has helped me a lot. And I've tried to impart that on every freshman that comes into the legislature when they ask me, give me some advice, and I always tell them that. And I'm pleased to see many of the new members of the legislature trying to do the same. And so despite the fact that it doesn't seem that way, we're in an election year, everything you see and hear in the news seems so polarizing, there is a collegiality that does occur and bills are done on a bipartisan basis. Yeah, I, I do think you know, the more time you spend, whether you're a, a staffer or a reporter, the more time you spend, especially on those late nights covering a committee hearing, you realize everyone does really get along. And you they, have sat yeah. through those joint finance <laughs> yep. committees that go late, and, and you see everyone's the back joking and forth around. And, and, yep. You know, yeah. it's. I think you have to respect that. You know, everybody is passionate and they believe in what they believe, and I have to respect that because I want other people to respect that. I have the beliefs that I have. And you try to work within that. So you asked for examples of, yeah, of bipartisanship. Yeah. I think one of the bills that I'm most proud of that in, was bipartisan was the changes to how mental health services are provided in Milwaukee County. And I was actually challenged by somebody in my own party. I won't say who. And they said that I would never get a Democrat to vote for that bill. And I said, why? You just won't. And I said, well, watch me. <laughs> if there's anything anyone knows about me, give me a challenge and I will, I will take it. And I, um, I reached out to people who represent Milwaukee County, Lena Taylor and Tim Carpenter. And we sat down in the parlor off the Senate floor. And I remember, and I brought Joe Sanfilippo in, who is the author in the assembly. And I said, guys, what can we do to make this bill better? Mental health issues aren't Republican issues. They're yeah. not Democrat issues. We all have friends, family members who are affected. And they actually gave me some really good ideas that somehow we missed during the process of going through hearings. And we wrote them up. And the bill was passed 33 to nothing. Wow. And you can imagine <laughs> that I directly went back to that other person and said, there you go. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, so you're, you're, you brought up your work on the health committee, which reminded me of a time that I and some other reporters were covering the health committee and uh, someone who was there to testify fell ill and there was a nurse in the room. <laughs> you were able to um, to help this woman get the, the help that she needed and, and get her through those you know early stages. Um, Once and, a nurse, always a nurse. She right. just really can't walk away from it. And it was clear to me that she was in distress. And I um, saw the signs and immediately went into action. And I was glad that I did. And I did get to go visit her at the hospital afterwards. She was having um, a leak to an aneurysm. Oh, wow. And she was a very feisty woman, must have been close to 80, sweet lady. And she didn't get a chance to testify because she felt ill and she left. And then we made sure she go, went to the hospital. She was, When I say feisty, she was fighting me. She did not want me to call 911. And I said, yeah. I am calling 911. Mm -hmm. And so I went to visit her afterwards because her son reached out to me to tell me she was doing well and to thank me. And I had a great little visit with her. And then she pointed to the bedside table and said, see those papers over there? I want you to take that. That's the testimony that I wasn't able to give at that hearing. Can you please take that? And I yep. said, yes, I will. <laughs> and I will make sure that everybody on the committee gets a copy of it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah, it was um, right. You just, that, that instinct kicked in. Um, the nursing aspect of your life is clearly still a, a big part of who you are. What drew you into that career uh, initially? Well, you know, it's interesting because my mom never told me this. My mom was, and, and my father, neither of my parents were able to go to college. And she was always the person in the neighborhood that everybody ran to when there was an emergency. She was calm under pressure, always uh, the go-to person. Or other moms would say, go have Mrs. Papa Chris do look at that. And that must have rubbed off on me. And she never told me that... You know, in her heart, she wanted to be a nurse, but she was unable to go to college. And when I finally told her that I wanted to be a nurse, I still remember she burst into tears and she said, that's exactly what I wanted to do, and I'm so excited. So I've enjoyed it. It's truly a, a wonderful profession, and I've continued to work, other than the campaign this past year and a half <laughs> yeah. has made it difficult, but I've wanted to stay grounded in the real world because it's been such an important part of my life, so I've maintained work as a nurse. 
And I, I remember that feeling when I first got into the legislature. You kind of scratch your head and go, what did I just get myself into? And there's no manual for how to be a lawmaker. <laughs> yeah. And then suddenly my nursing skills kicked in because as a nurse, you first and foremost have to listen to patients. You um, identify a problem, you come up with a solution, you apply that solution, and if it's not working, then you gotta do something else. And having worked in critical care, you gotta do that something else, sometimes really fast, and I wish government worked that fast. (laughs) It doesn't, but I, I quickly learned that that process of thinking and problem solving applied really well to being a lawmaker, and also the fact that you advocate for your patients, now you're changing that role to advocating for your constituents and those that have elected you. It was a really easy transition. And I I talk to nursing students a lot. I get asked to speak on college campuses because I'm a bit of a novelty being a nurse and a lawmaker. Mm -hmm. And I try to impart that on them and say that this process of thinking that you've learned here in nursing will apply to so many different fields in your life, from parenting to any other profession that you may choose. And it's it's very rewarding to be able to do that. Healthcare has obviously been a major component of this Senate race. Um, Glad you're bringing it up. <laughs> uh, well, I'd, I'd like to know, what is what is your ideal approach to, to federal health care policy, having experience in that world? What, what would you like to see done? Well, it's not federal health care, and that's the big difference <laughs> between myself and Senator Baldwin, who believes in a $32 trillion takeover of health care. Let me talk a little bit about my approach, and then I want to talk about how stark of contrast and the problems that are presented by Senator Baldwin that I don't think she is efficiently or effectively and Answered. First of all, I believe in a patient-centered approach to health care, and we've really lost that. I think the big lie of 2013 was that if you like your doctor, you get to keep your doctor, and people have learned that that is not the case. And so a patient-centered uh, free market approach to health care, which even before Obamacare went into place, we didn't have a free market approach. There was way too much government involved. And instead of getting rid of layers of health care, we added more. And now Senator Baldwin, Baldwin wants to take it a step further. So if you really want to have a patient-centered approach, individuals have to have information, transparency, so that they know the cost of procedures, so that they can shop around. And that's going to create the competition to drop the cost of health care. Now, critics will immediately say, oh, I'm supposed to shop around when I'm having chest pain. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about basic procedures. And think about the areas of health care where we do have information, LASIK surgery, MRIs, uh, certain aspects of dentistry, plastic surgery. People shop around. What has happened to the cost of those? The costs have gone down. And that's an important aspect of competition. So that's the information part, transparency. And I won't let any medical provider or insurance provider tell me that they can't provide that information. They can and they should. And and that's the first step that has to be done. It can be done. Then you need to have the tools to make decisions about your health care dollars. And so that means you have to have health savings accounts, other vehicles where you have control over your health care dollars. It gives you skin in the game. And right now, people don't have that. They don't know. They're so separated from what the actual cost of health care is. But it does change your decision-making if you know how much something costs and you can shop around. Also, you're not going to go into an emergency room at 3 in the morning if you know it's going to cost you more out of your health care dollars. And it's a minor problem that could wait until the next day where it won't cost you as much. We need to have uh, then the ability to purchase different types of health care plans instead of having every single plan with the same essential elements. Let's create that market so that a 22-year-old coming out of college, a, a young male who doesn't want all the bells and whistles, doesn't want to have you know maternity care at that stage in his life, doesn't have to have it, that's going to create the necessary market uh, that will apply to more people. Association health plans, that's another aspect. Obviously, they've been doing that on the federal level. So that that's basically it. And we need to have an army of consumers with information and tools to make decisions about their health care to infuse consumerism that will lower cost and increase the quality of care. Now, contrast that to what Senator Baldwin wants to do, her $32 trillion takeover of health care. I've challenged her in debates. She hasn't been able to, and others have asked her where that money's going to come from, and she hasn't answered that. Her plan would dismantle Medicare, Medicare Advantage, Medicaid, the TRICARE program that our 
veterans use. It would dismantle the Affordable Care Act, and it would get rid of employer-based private insurance. Even Canada and England, their socialized medicine approaches still allow you to purchase private insurance. It's called Medicare for All. It's a misnomer. And I called Senator Baldwin out on that in the first debate. And she said, what do you mean? It's my bill is Medicare for all. How could it get rid of Medicare? I said, read the bill. I've read the bill. It says it point blank. In over a four-year period of time, all of those programs are dismantled. I call it chaos for all because suddenly our seniors are not going to have access to their Medicare program, their Medicare Advantage. And here's the big issue that nobody is picking up on. And maybe you will, Jesse, from here on out. 3.4 million people in Wisconsin have their insurance through their employers, private insurance. That insurance would be gone. That's wrong. And at the same time uh, that Senator Baldwin is not telling the truth about her plan, uh, she's coming after me and saying that I want to get rid of coverage for pre-existing conditions. This is the big lie of this election cycle, that Republicans want to get rid of coverage for pre-existing conditions. And I want to make sure that your listeners know that I am committed to having that coverage for people. And I've said it before, I'll say it again, I'll fall in front of a truck before I let people go without pre-existing condition coverage. Federal law says, and this is law that went into place before Obamacare, that if you're on Medicare, Medicaid, or employer insurance, you have coverage for pre-existing conditions. If federal law goes away, that law is still there. The remaining people we can take care of through a health insurance risk sharing pool. The good news is because of Republican principles, Wisconsin has such a low unemployment rate right now for the last eight months under 3%. That means even more people have access to employer-based insurance, and that means a smaller number of people that we have to care for in that safety net, and we're committed to it, I'm committed to it, and I just wanna make sure that your listeners know that that is a lie that is being perpetuated, and I'm not gonna stand for it. Other issues that have, have played a larger role that your campaign has brought up are veterans' issues, and um, particularly Senator Baldwin's handling of the overprescription scandal at the Toma VA. Um, could you just talk a little bit about your concerns with that, um, where you think that she has uh, failed, and, and whether you think that she's done enough to, uh, I guess, atone for, for what went wrong in the first place? Well, she has done something, but she did it after the fact. She sat on a report for eight months that showed that a doctor was overprescribing opioids. M many of the veterans were addicted. One did die. She um, ignored that report for whatever reason. I'll say political reasons. And this is a serious problem. The drugs were leaching out into the community as well. The hospital was known, was given the nickname the Candyland, and the doctor was given the name Candyman. And she did nothing. Had it not been for a whistleblower, a veteran who worked at the VA, who finally put pressure on her office to release the report, she would not have done it. And what did she do in reaction to that? She hired Hillary Clinton's attorneys to do her cover-up work. She offered taxpayer hush money to her staff member who did the right thing and made sure that the report got out. That's wrong. You know, if you can't be accountable to our veterans, you can't be accountable to anyone in the state of Wisconsin. And you know, she has pushed back and has said that the family of the veteran, you know, are upset and want me to take down my ads. And I, I really commend Jason Simkowski's family for being able to forgive Tammy Baldwin. But I look at it through the eyes as a military mom that, you know, that could be my son. That could be any one of the veterans in that hospital. It's not just that one family that was affected. There are families that are still dealing with the effects of what happened there. And it's wrong for her to now say that, you know, she's taken care of the problem and she never turned her back on the veterans. She did, she won't admit it, and she did a horrible cover up, which to me is really, truly behavior unbecoming of someone who uh, should be representing us in Washington. What are some of the other areas that, when you look at Tammy Baldwin's career, what are the things that make you say, this isn't working. Well, you, you hit the nail on the head when you said career. She is a career politician. She has been working in the halls of government since she was 24 for 32 years. You contrast that to me as somebody who's a citizen legislator, someone who has always stayed grounded working in the real world. 
You know, Tammy Baldwin talks a good game. She says that she stands with the middle class, but her actions show anything but that. You know, she spends most of her time on the East Coast and the West Coast and the Hamptons with Senator Gillibrand and Senator Harris. In fact, I think Senator Harris was just here visiting her this past weekend. And she's forgotten the middle class. She voted against the tax cuts. And she gives an answer that, you know, she thinks tax policy should be geared towards the middle class and not the wealthy. Well, this tax policy has been geared towards the middle class. And as I've traveled around this great state, putting on close to 92,000 miles on my car, the middle class are telling me, and I'm a middle class mom myself, they're, they're telling me that these tax cuts have made a difference. And they want certainty to know that those tax cuts are going to continue. And I think they need to continue. It has infused the the economy and has greatly helped not only Wisconsin, but our country. And along with that, she has voted to increase taxes 413 times since she has been in Washington. And that, to me, is not being a good steward of the taxpayer's money. We have to look within. As a middle-class mom myself, I know that I've had to look and balance my budgets. Families do it every day around their kitchen table. They expect people in Washington to do the same and not just uh, tax away and with other people's money. Tammy Baldwin thinks that taxpayer money is the government's money. I think it's the people's money. So looking beyond the election, if you are elected, what are your other priorities for your first term in office? Health care reform, continued tax reform, which we've seemed to have touched on, continuing to ensure that our military is built properly so that they have the resources and that we always protect our veterans. And then immigration reform is a very big issue. In fact, these are all the issues that I've heard from people all around the state. So they're not necessarily my issues, they're, even though they are, but they mirror what the people of the state have told me as I've listened to them. Immigration reform. I'm the daughter of Greek immigrants. Jesse, you've heard me say this before. I grew up in a big, fat Greek family and had a great childhood memory of aunts and uncles coming much later to this country after my father came before. And I helped them study for their naturalization citizenship test. I helped them study English. In fact, my cousins and I used to divvy up the time. I wanted to make sure I maintained my proficiency in the Greek language, and they (laughs) wanted to learn English. So when we'd play, we would say, okay, half hour Greek, half hour English. And I watched them go through a process of becoming legal citizens. And I feel very strongly that we are a nation of laws, and those laws have to be upheld. And then I compare that to Senator Baldwin, who who stands uh, and is very quiet. She won't answer, but she aligns herself with the entire party's extreme open borders position, abolishing ICE, you know, standing for sanctuary cities. That's not what I'm hearing from the people in this state of Wisconsin. They want border security. They want to make sure that there is a wall that is built and that wall is important not just because of illegal immigration, but it's human trafficking, it's drug trafficking, it's a public health risk. Now, there are outbreaks of various diseases and illnesses along those border communities, and it has to be established for all of those reasons. So by the time this airs, it will probably have already passed, but President Trump is coming to campaign for you and for Governor Walker in the next few days. We know he wasn't your first choice in the primary, but I think it's safe to say that you've been pretty pleased with his time in office. So how do you envision yourself working with the president if you're serving in the Senate? Well, I'm excited that the president's coming to Wisconsin. And right, he wasn't my first choice. And I think it was clear in Wisconsin that people were all over the map. Mm -hmm. I did stand with him once he became our nominee, and I never looked back. I'm pleased with what the president is doing. I know a lot of people, including Senator Baldwin, want to bring him down. But I want to see him succeed because when he succeeds, America succeeds. And he is succeeding. When I look at regulatory reform, when I look at tax reform, when I look at building our military, when I look at picking Supreme Court justices who uphold the Constitution, he's doing all of that. Even tariffs, which has a lot of people scratching their heads. I mean, I'm a free market person. Mm -hmm. Uh, I believe he is too, but he believes in free trade but fair trade. And I've spent a lot of time talking to farmers who are willing to give him the time to negotiate fair deals because they know they're not getting those fair deals and they need access to more markets. So I think he's he's doing all of those things. He's following through on the promises and that's what I like, that's what people like that I'm talking to. 
And they like the fact that he just tells it like it is. <laughs> um, so you have been trailing Tammy Baldwin the last few weeks of polling. Um, how much does that impact you as you're approaching these last few weeks? And what's the strategy to, to cross the finish line? Polls are just snapshots in time. They've been all over the map. They were incorrect in 2016 <laughs> uh, for both Senator Johnson and for Donald Trump. I'm staying focused on getting my message out there of common sense reform, of having a representative who understands the concerns and challenges of the middle class. And that's what I'm going to continue doing between now and November 6th. And and I, you know, I feel very confident there's been a lot of momentum over the course of the last month, in particular, the events around Judge Kavanaugh and his nomination, you know, have, have left a... Uh, an eerie feeling in the, on the part of many people who have watched the protests, have watched the reactions to the hearings, and it's reminded them of what we went through here in Wisconsin. And I think many people believe that people went a little too far in Wisconsin, and they're starting to see that, and that has brought out our base. They're very energized. They're very excited. And it also highlights one of the differences, another difference between myself and Senator Baldwin, and that she you know, really within 48 hours of his announcement, the president announcing Kavanaugh, she had already made up her mind and wouldn't even meet with him, but she said she wasn't going to vote for him. And again, that's not being a representative of the people. And it's your job to go through that confirmation process and meet with the individual. And I would have done that. Your differences are very clear. Uh, Can you name something that you either think Senator Baldwin has done well or something about her personally that you respect or admire? Well, I think that Senator Baldwin has, you know, had a difficult childhood and she's been open and I think that's good. I think it's important that people understand addiction and what it's like. Despite all of that, she's been able to achieve and to work hard. Uh, So I, I respect that about her. It also disappoints me a little bit because I think that she should have been more sensitive to what happened. But Again, you know, it's it could not have been an easy childhood. Wedge Issues is sponsored by wispolitics.com. You can become a wispolitics.com member. Find out more at wispolitics.com slash membership. You ready to move into our lightning round? Sure. Okay. What is your favorite Wisconsin beer? I'm a Liney's original. I went to Marquette University with Dick Lining Kugel. He's a friend of mine. <laughs> and 18 was the drinking age back then. Mm-hmm. I want to make sure that's abundantly <laughs> yeah. clear. No law breaking. So I like the, ori- I like the original. That well, is, definitely a Wisconsin beer. Yeah. That is an underrated beer, I, th- I think. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. Um, What's the best advice that your parents or someone who was important to you gave you when you were growing up? Well, certainly watching my father come to this country with a penny in his pocket and a dream in his heart, I think the biggest lesson was have a dream and work hard and achieve it. And that's what I have done. And I followed through on that. My parents wanted me to get a college education because they never did. And I was proud to do that and even take it a step further, get my master's degree. But work hard. And, and follow through on your promises. Who are your political role models? There are several. I would probably name two or three. Obviously, Margaret Thatcher. I admire her greatly, have studied her, read about her, read her writings. And I watched her and Ronald Reagan and Pope John Paul II as they you know, stood and brought down communism together. So it was a fascinating time in my life. So she intrigued me, and I've always followed her and have been honored to have been given the Iron Lady Award by a couple organizations. So I admire her greatly. More locally, there are two people. And one is uh, another Margaret, (laughs) Margaret Farrow, Mm -hmm. our former lieutenant governor. Uh, She's been a great mentor. I've known her for years. I knew her when she was a state senator. And I have always been able to talk to her. I think she's got a strong core set of beliefs, and she follows through on it. And the third one is someone I've already mentioned, Ted Cannabis, who was a dear, dear friend, a childhood friend. We grew up together. It's a, it's really sad that he passed away a year ago, very young. But uh, he uh, certainly someone I've always admired. Sounds like he had really a, a huge impact on the, the legislature overall. Yes, he did. Yeah. 
Um, what is the best concert that you've attended? Whoa. I would have to say, believe it or not, I had the opportunity when I was in high school to see Frank Sinatra. Wow. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. And yes, my uncle had tickets and it was the three aunts and the three daughters. And so the six of us went and it is will always be one of those memories. And to this day, I really like the crooner music. I, yeah. I got to see Michael Buble more recently mm-hmm. and because I like that genre of music. Yeah. I have a mixed genre of music, as you know. And you <laughs> yep. made fun of me on, <laughs> on Twitter about it, you know, liking ACDC as well and liking EDM. and It's a lot of variety. Uh, I know, but yeah. it's, it depends on the mood I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm right there with you. I mean, not so much on the EDM, but, like, I can go all over the place, oh, too. EDM it's, is yeah. great workout music. I could, yeah, that's... that's <laughs> I just need to work out more is the problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you have any pet peeves? Pet peeves? Hmm. Well, I don't like being late, mm-hmm. and I don't like it when people are late. Mm-hmm. In fact, there's a funny story about that. When I first got into the legislature, I went to the first caucus up in Gar, and it w- I got there 20 minutes early, and the sergeant of arms was getting the room ready, and I said, isn't this where the caucus is for the Assembly Republicans? And he goes, yeah, who are you? <laughs> I said, well, I'm Leah Vukmir, and he said, oh, you're a freshman. You're here early. <laughs> it's going to be a while. And I said, no, I'm a nurse. Nurses are always on time. <laughs> so if, if I'm late for something, it's nails on the chalkboard for me because yeah. I don't want to be late. You yeah. always have to be prompt. If you were not campaigning, uh, what would a, a typical fall weekend look like for you right now? What oh, would you do to relax? if I had time to take long walks with my dog, Sophie, my German Shepherd rescue dog, Thankfully, I have lots of good friends who are doing that for me, but this is the perfect weather to take her for a nice long walk. I have to admit, I'd like to uh, be able to get a few uh, rounds of golf in. That's something I was unable to do this summer. (laughs) I I, um, learned how to golf from my dad who discovered the, the sport late in life, and my kids both golfed and grew up on the county courses in Milwaukee, and they uh, became good golfers. My daughter played collegiate golf, so I wish I had the opportunity to do a round of golf, Uh, but it'll probably be too cold by November 7th. Probably. (laughs) You never know. Wisconsin's weird that way, if you get a good day. Um, So you you have a dog. Do you have any other pets? Just a dog, yeah. How, How long have you had your dog? Going on six years now, and she was a project of my son. He wanted me to have a a dog, a security dog, and uh, a German Shepherd certainly is. He started sending me pictures of uh, dogs from various humane societies around the state because we had agreed we were going to rescue. Mm -hmm. And um, when I saw the picture of Sophie, she was at the Columbia County Humane Society. Uh, My heart jumped into my throat and as soon as we were able to go up there, we brought her home. She's been a great, great uh, joy. Yeah. That's, dogs could just kind of make your life complete. Yes, I think. they do. <laughs> yeah. Okay. If you had a Wisconsin bucket list, so things that you would stereotypically associate with Wisconsin, but something that you haven't done that you've maybe always wanted to try, what would that be? Well, I've never had the opportunity to play Whistling Straits, and Ooh, given yeah. that I have a daughter <laughs> who um, you know plays played collegiately and plays a heck of a lot better than her <laughs> mom, um, and my son plays too. I would love uh, to. It's a great place in Wisconsin. It's a beautiful part of our state, and yeah. I've traveled up to every corner of this state, and I've got to admit, it's beautiful. So I've never had that opportunity, so maybe someday I'll, that would be on my bucket list for Wisconsin. be a big one. Um, what is your favorite movie? My favorite movie? You can hmm. name a couple, too. I don't know if you can narrow okay. it. Okay. Yeah. Sandlot? Oh, <laughs> that's a classic. It's yeah. a total Americana movie. Yeah. Um, and uh, I would have to say I also enjoyed um, It's a Wonderful Life at Christmas. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's a classic. It's endearing. Mm-hmm. And, and that would be one of the other ones that are right up there. Yeah. One. Okay. One more. Okay. Hitch yeah. is a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. God, I have <laughs> not watched that movie in a long time. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good, again, like a good variety. Yes. Yeah. But Sandlot, it, Sandlot is one of my favorites because it's just Americana at mm-hmm. its best. Yeah. That's a, that's a classic. I'm going to go home and watch those now. <laughs> uh, are you ready for your last lightning round question? Sure. Favorite Wisconsin cheese? Oh, that's easy. 
That would be a nice aged cheddar. Love my cheddar. Very and Wisconsin, good. Wisconsin's got the best cheese. It's absolutely true. Yeah. Best cows, best cheese. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. California has nothing on us. That's right. <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much for coming in and taking the time to do this. I'll let you close us out with anything you want to share with listeners. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Jesse, for this opportunity. And the stakes are high in this election, and, and the contrast is clear on who you want to go to Washington to stand for you. And I am somebody who understands the day-to-day challenges that are facing families. I've been there concerned as a concerned mom. I want to take what we have been able to accomplish here in Wisconsin, this Wisconsin way, this economic miracle, knowing how to get that done to Washington where they could use a good dose of our common sense, where they could use people who follow through on their promises. We've made Wisconsin great. We need to help have the reinforcements in Washington to continue the good work of our president in making America great. Thank you for listening to Wedge Issues. Our theme music is Oh, Wisconsin by Loxley. We're coming out with new episodes every Friday with a few bonuses here and there, so make sure you're subscribed on iTunes or anywhere else you get your podcasts so you don't miss one. If you have any feedback or suggestions for me, you can find me on Twitter at Jesse Opie, J-E-S-S-I-E-O-P-I-E, or you can email me at J-O-P-O-I-E-N at Madison.com. And if you really like what you hear, you can leave us a rating or review on iTunes, which helps us out a little bit. Thanks as always for listening. We'll see you next time. Wedge Issues has been brought to you by WISPolitics.com. There are plenty of benefits to becoming a member. You can go to WISPolitics.com slash membership to find out more.